Thank you, Regina, for the reminder. Uh, John Rotz. Yes, this is John Rotz. I'm the assistant chief here in the Motor Carrier Division of State Highway. Thank you, Dan Blevins. Morning, uh, Dan Blevins, principal planner with uh, Wamapco. Um, John Bressler, I'm going to save you for later because we'll do an introduction for you, if, if you don't mind. Uh, Amy? Good morning, Amy Wetterskog from the from Amtrak Planning. Uh, Jeff Enzer wasn't able to make it, so he delegated me. Ah, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Uh, Andrea? No. Yes. Hello. Yeah, just introduce yourself and who you're with. Okay, sure. My oh, name I know who it is. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, all. My name is Andrea Jackson, and I'm the Director of Communications for BMC. Thank you. Oh, these names just keep moving on me here. Anna. Good morning, everybody. I'm Anna Marshall, Environmental Planner at BMC. Armand. Good morning, everybody. Uh, Armand Patella with the Maryland Motor Truck Association and uh, have the honor of being the past chair of this group. Morning, Keith. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, Blake. Uh, Blake Fisher here with the uh, BMC Emergency Planner. Thank you. Uh, Deborah. Good morning. Deborah Price with Baltimore County DPWNT. Uh, I have Ed. I think there's only one, so. Good morning. This is Ed Mahalski of Ecologics Group. Um, Jacqueline. Thorne? Yes. Hi, Jack. <laughs> Sorry, if there's more than one, I'll give you the last name. <laughs> okay, Jacqueline Thorne, Maryland Department of Transportation, the Secretary's Office, Office of Rail and Intermodal Freight. Thank you. Kip? Uh, Kip Snow, Director of the Transportation Distribution Logistics Institute at the Community College of Baltimore County. Thank you, Lakeisha. Uh, good morning, um, Lakeisha Markley, Assistant Chief um, in our Innovative Performance Planning Division um, of OP at State Highway Administration. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Lewis? Uh, yes, Lewis Campion, Maryland Motor Truck Association. Um, I'm going to skip Michael Pack again because we'll do an introduction of him later. Uh, Nanette? Good morning. Nanette Shiki, Maryland uh, Department of Transportation Motor Vehicle Administration in Policy and Innovation, and I am the CAV Connected and Automated Vehicle Program Manager. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Nicole. Hi, good morning. Nicole Katsikidis, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. I'm in the Research Division. I manage the department's truck parking program. Thank you. Uh, Regina. Good morning, Regina Aris, Assistant Director for Transportation Planning at BMC. Thank you. Uh, Robert King. Robert King with Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration, Division Administrator for uh, Maryland Division. Awesome. Thank you. Roxanne. Good morning. Roxanne Mulcahy with the Maryland Transportation Authority, Coordinator for Freight Activities. Thank you. Tim. Good morning, Tim Briggs, Planner, Baltimore Metropolitan Council. And Tina. Good morning, Tina Sanders, uh, Maryland Medicare Division, State Highway. Thank you. JT, I think I missed you. John Thomas or JT, <clears throat> Director of Rail and Intermodal Freight for the MDOT Secretary's Office. Thank you, Kevin Clark. Hi, guys. Kevin Clark, uh, Director of Planning and Environmental Services, Maryland Aviation Administration. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, Kristen. Good morning, everyone. Kristen Scudder. I'm the Freight Program Manager at the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission. Thank you. Did I miss anybody? Sounds like I got everybody, so that's great. Um, so I just want to uh, thank everyone for coming again. Uh, normally at this time, our committee chair uh, would have a few words of wisdom for us, but uh, 
He's currently out on paternity leave, so I'll take the opportunity to say a few words on his behalf. Uh, so we live in an ever-evolving world of goods movement, and this committee's uh, desire to continue to advance freight interests, uh, including efficiency and quality of life in the Baltimore region, are uh, to, really to be commended. Uh, over the next couple of years, we can expect a lot of changes with the uh, amount of freight being moved in the region, uh, with the ultimate completion of the Howard Street Tunnel, uh, the potential expansion of the Sparrows Point Container Terminal, and of course, the reconstruction of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Uh, it's going to take a concerted effort from uh, all of us to ensure that we continue to move goods uh, efficiently throughout the region. So uh, I just want to uh, thank everybody for your continued support on this committee um, uh, and I look forward to moving forward with uh, in future meetings and, and future presentations. Um, so at this time, uh, I'd like to just get approval of the previous minutes. Uh, most of you uh, that are on the distribution list uh, probably received those minutes uh, with the invitation to the meeting. Um, I'm not going to take a roll call for everything, but if anybody has any uh, questions or comments about the uh, minutes or additions or anything like that, uh, please let me know. And hearing nothing, I'm going to assume then that the, the meeting minutes uh, are approved. Um, so thank you. Um, at this time, then, I guess I want to invite our first uh, speaker, uh, introduce our first speaker, Mr. Michael Pack from the University of Maryland's Cat Lab. Uh, and Mr. Pack will be providing us with an overview of uh, RITUS data. Um, so um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, uh, Michael, and you can take over. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, hopefully you can all see my screen right now. I'm going to be talking about some of the, the data sets and some of the analytics that we've been building out into the RITUS platform over the, the past couple of years now uh, that a lot of folks are probably not aware of. Uh, if you're not familiar with what RITUS is, it's a, a system that essentially takes any sort of transportation data or data that's related to transportation, and it tries to bring it together and standardize and fuse it together to present a common situational awareness uh, view of, of what's happening with transportation. Um, and then we archive all that data. We build analytics that sit on top of that. Uh, now, traditionally, this has been things like crashes and disabled vehicles and speeds on the roadway, but we are now uh, multimodal. Um, <clears throat> so we've, within the last year, we've started tracking maritime vessels globally, and we do this in real time, but then we archive the data as well. <clears throat> so this is going to include not just the, the vessel location, but uh, vessel uh, type, sometimes we get a little bit of cargo information associated with the vessel, but we know it's origin and destination um, and, and speed and heading and all that sort of stuff. So I'm just zooming out here to show you uh, that we have this for a good portion of, well, we have it for the entire world. Um, <clears throat> and we're using satellite tracking, not just terrestrial tracking of the AIS transponders. So here we down we are down in the Gulf, and uh, you can go inland as well. So we're looking at the the inland waterways and the barges and other stuff that's moving up and down the rivers. Um, and we do it uh, we do this globally, truly globally. So here's a screenshot where we're looking at traffic and maritime data over in in Italy and um, other parts of Europe. <laughs> and we've been doing this for a little more than a year now. So we have an archive of this uh, and it's it's useful in real time. So when the, um, when the bridge collapsed, we used it to monitor the search and rescue efforts. So here you can see the, all the different uh, ships responding uh, to the bridge collapse. And you can see some of the search and rescue vehicles going back and forth and looking for survivors. Um, you also saw the, the vessels that were bound for the Seagirt terminal, they started to just anchor 
and, and loiter uh, uh, south of the, the Bay Bridge, not quite knowing what to do. We're seeing that again now because of the, the labor strike. Uh, but in addition to uh, uh, maritime vessels, we are also tracking air traffic globally. Uh, so here I'm showing you the location of airplanes on the ground in, uh, I think this is Memphis, at the Memphis airport. And we're able to see them moving around on the ground. And then once they take to the skies, we see them flying around. And you can click on each of these and you can see you know, their, their flight path and their origin and their destination. Um, and again, this is both nationally and globally being done. So here we are back in, in Italy where I was showing you the maritime traffic earlier. Um, and again, this was also used during the, um, the, the early days of the bridge collapse to, uh, to watch the search and rescue efforts. So here we've got the helicopters isolated and showing them circling over the bridge, trying to help out with the response. So <clears throat> we've built out several real-time monitoring dashboards that are being used to help monitor all the different modes in Maryland. We have one for highways, we have one for transit, we've got one for the port as well. And we're trying to tie in the modes as much as possible. So here we're showing uh, the terminals, we're showing the, uh, the vessels that are moving around in the area. And then we're able to show you the current turn time and the current queue time, and then we sh show you what it is right now compared to what it was the prior week. We're able to show that. Then we show the roads, the congestion on the roads going to the terminal. So you see whether or not congestion is better or worse than it would normally be at this time of day and this day of week. We tell you how many vessels are arriving, how many vessels are docked, how many vessels are, how many berths are available. And if there's any weather advisories, that pops up as well. We do something similar for the airport. So at the airport, you can actually see the, uh, the aircraft taxing on the runway or taking off or landing. Um, we again show weather advisories, the number of arrivals and departures, and then the traffic going to and coming from the airport on the two main roads that lead to the airport. We also show any sort of crashes or construction zones that are impacting people getting to and from the airport, the wait times to get through security, depending on which concourse and which um, type of security uh, you're going through, parking availability, and then arrivals and departure logs. Uh, we're also showing, uh, in a new version, we're showing cancellations by airline, uh, so you can see if there's a particular meltdown with one of the airlines or something like that. So those are some of the newer data sets that we are we are collecting. So what, what can we do with this information? Well, uh, right after the bridge collapsed, we started looking at uh, shipping diversions. So you know we noticed that there were a number of ships, uh, two ships that went to Davisville, and then we had others that went, one that went to New York, four that went to Philadelphia, five to Wilmington, six to Norfolk, one to Jacksonville and one went down to San Juan uh, for some reason. I'm not sure why why that happened. Uh, but you know, because we're tracking these things, you're able to see, okay, you know, the day before, here's where they were. Then they were heading up as if they were going to, well, they were definitely going to the port of Baltimore. And then at nine o'clock in the morning, they changed course and decided to, to go down to Jacksonville instead. And it took them um, two, two days. Uh, to get down there. Uh, same thing for one that left Wilmington early in the morning on the 26th, and then in the afternoon of the 26th, decided to change course and went up to uh, New York instead. Um, so in addition to just tracking where things are going, you're able to look at you know, how, how vessel traffic in and out of certain areas of changing. So we were just looking in the general vicinity of the, the Patapsco and looking at the key bridge and how that collapse impacted cargo vessels. And of course, you know, they went down in the area, 
but you saw an un uptick in port operations and other government uh, vessels coming in to help with the response. I mean, this is, you know, this is not really news, right? Just showing some examples of, of what can be done. Um, it was, we were lucky in that there were a whole lot of ships that exited uh, the Patapsco just before the bridge collapsed. Uh, so that kind of worked out in someone's favor. Uh, far more exits than entries. Um, we've also used this information to understand the potential impact of the uh, ILL, ILA strike. Uh, we did this uh, analysis a couple of weeks ago where we're looking at some of the, the North Atlantic ports and their shipping volumes over the last year or so. Uh, the blue line right here is Baltimore. So you can see what type of uh, traffic it uh, the port has received over the past year compared to some of the other other ports like uh, Boston, Philadelphia, and uh, New York and New Jersey. Um, and then we looked at the different types of ships that were coming into the port of Baltimore, whether they were car carrier ships versus you know dry bulk or or what have you. These are very basic analytics, but just trying to understand what type of traffic is coming in. Then we looked at all the commodity data as well. So, um, you know, what what is it that's uh, coming in? You know, in in terms of the the value of the commodity. So here we've got the total import value in billions for all commodities for different ports. Again, Baltimore is going to be continuously here in blue, right here. So you can see how it compares uh, to some of the other other ports. And we've also got the export, not just the value but the weight. Uh, we can look at that as well, see what's going in and out. Uh, export value in billions, not uh, billions of dollars, not just weight. Um, so trying to get a sense of you know what the economic impact might be in the region. So all that's basic stuff that can be done for the port data. But then we also wanted to look at uh, origins and destinations of trucks that are moving in and around these port facilities in Baltimore. So we have access to a, a freight uh, origin destination and, and routing data set. And we're able to look at trucks that were starting from uh, the port of Baltimore, the Seager Terminal area. And of all the trucks that were you know, leaving that area, what was their destination? Where were they going to? What percent were continuing on north versus going south or what have you? Um, same thing for destinations. Uh, where were they where were they going to? And we're also able to put together just big zone maps of the entire area. Uh, so this is like before the bridge collapsed, all the trucks that were starting here, where were they going to? What percent were continuing south on ninety five or going? out west, uh, Route 70, and then switching that to after, uh, after the bridge collapsed, you know, did did the actual destinations change any? And, you know, changed a little, didn't change a, a whole lot. But I think more interesting is we have the, uh, what's called breadcrumb trails of these vehicles moving around the area. So we're able to isolate, again, the trucks that are coming from this area. And then we want to see, okay, for everyone who's driving from this port area out to uh, I-70 and going out west, what routes were they taking before the bridge collapsed? Each of these blue lines is a particular route. And we've drawn a green screen line here. It tells us that for, for trucks going out uh, west on 70, 93% of them were going across the key bridge. 1% were going here. 6% were going all the way around 695. That's before the bridge collapsed. Now let's look at after the bridge collapsed. Of course, nobody's getting across the bridge. And that 6% going around 695 now jumps to 43%. And you got 55% going through the tunnel on uh, I-95 there. We did the same thing for people that were leaving the terminal and heading south uh, to I-95. You know, what percent were taking uh, different routes before the bridge collapsed and then after the bridge collapsed? Um, so obviously you've got a shift. So most people are going across 695. Look up here in these um, 
arterials and watch what changes. This is before, this is after. You can see there's a lot more people that are going uh, up and around. Some people are going directly through Baltimore, which is, is wild to me. Um, and then we did the same thing for people who were using the Bay Bridge who left the, the terminal here. Of course, 96%, we're going straight over 695. And let's switch to after the bridge collapsed. And you can see now more people are going up and around and trying to go through the tunnels. Uh, no one was really going all the way around 695, but some people were cutting cutting through the city. Um, so maritime traffic is new. Um, uh, air traffic is new. These origins, destinations, and the routes that trucks specifically are taking is relatively new as well. And we've built out these tools that help people to analyze, uh, analyze the movements of these data relatively easily. If anyone on this call is you know, part of the Maryland state government or doing work for a Maryland state government, we could probably get access uh, to you for some of these data sets and some of these analytics. Um, just uh, you know, feel free to reach out to me if any of this is of interest to you and I can answer a few questions if we have time. Yeah, thank you. That was amazing data. That's that's pretty impressive. Um, yeah, if if there's anybody that has any questions, uh, yeah, we can take a couple minutes for that. Yeah, John. I've got a yeah, Michael. John Bressler here at the American Association of Port Authorities. Great presentation. Very impressive data. I was wondering, based on your ability to collect this data, do you have any information you could share about cargo and trade flows thus far uh, for, from the strike? Like the any any potential ship diversions, anything you could you could share at this point in live time? Uh, I I don't. Um, so we our bread and butter at the Cat Lab is collecting the data and then making it available in tools to analysts to do the analysis. We don't tend to do a lot of analysis ourselves unless someone specifically asks us to. Um, and no one has asked. Well, we did have a, a request to do some analysis pre-strike, but no one's asked us to do anything post-strike. I have seen, however, a lot of ships that have just anchored and don't know where to go and what to do. And, and when, when the bridge collapsed initially, a lot of those ships were anchoring further away from the port. And with the, uh, with the strike, you've got more ships that are stuck right next to the port and in other places there. It's not quite as uh, organized, it seems like. Interesting. Now, are you seeing those ships anchored or drifting all up along the East Coast in the Gulf or just in specific areas, would you say? Um, you know, I haven't looked this morning to see, but while we're talking, I will just open up my browser and we'll take a look and we'll see we'll see what's going on. It's it's fairly easy to to look at this stuff. Um, it's wild. You, you click on the vessels and you see them just circling in a, a time. That's period. that is wild. <clears throat> Take me just a second to log in. Does anyone else have any questions while I bring this up? Yeah, Michael, this is Nicole. I was just curious. So just, can you clarify, I might have missed it. Was this work um, for MDOT? Uh, no, this is not work. Well, the, the uh, looking at the rerouting of trucks mm -hmm. um, after the bridge collapse, that's stuff that we did for MDOT. Uh, the, the, Air traffic and the maritime traffic, that is not something that was done for, for MDOT. Okay, so um, yeah, I guess what I'm after is how can we get access to that? Or is that something that like states or the feds would pay, would need to purchase from Cat Lab, the access for that? Yeah, well, it's, it's technically not from me, um, but but yes, that, that data is from uh, a private sector provider that has satellites that you know are circling the globe, and uh, we we purchase that data for internal research purposes. I see. Um, if someone else wanted access to that data, we could help 
make arrangements. We could either sell it to you through us, or we could put you in touch with the companies that have that data and you could get it from them directly. Okay, thank you. Michael, I know um, you mentioned about if uh, you know, governments wanted access, but what about just the slides themselves? Can we at least have the slide show itself or now? Yeah, we can we can uh, put a PDF together and send it out to you. Great. Thank you. Yeah, and we'll post that on our website too after the meeting. So here I'm I'm looking live. Um, you know, there's a bunch of dry bulk container ships that are you know that are that are down here that I think are probably unsure of what to do. Yeah. So they're just they're hanging out, they're hovering. And this is fairly normal. You have people that kind of congregate there. But what is what is abnormal is at least yesterday I was seeing quite a few ships that were just hanging out in here and weren't able to dock. And you can see them just circling. That's fascinating. Yeah. That's a that's a sail ship. That then doesn't count. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, if we go other places around the, the world, we'd, or around the U.S. at least, we'd probably see the same same thing. And analyzing that we are working on tools to make it easier to just go in and click a few buttons and ask questions about origins and destinations of ships. Uh, right now, we are doing, you know, when someone asks for analysis, we have a data science team that's going in and they're exploring the data sets and trying to derive insights it takes a little bit longer to do but um, it's it's fun it's a fun data set to look at we uh we used it to look at the um impacts of the um the red sea shipping disruptions and looking at how people are um uh de detouring around that where they're going um and uh, you know how much fuel, extra fuel, is being consumed uh, because of that that disruption and having to go around to Africa. It's great, thank you, Michael. Yeah, these are all right here. These are tanker ships and cargo ships, kind of hanging out right here. Yeah, that's that's crazy. Uh, okay, Th thank you. Any other questions for Michael before we move to our next speaker? All right, well, thanks, Michael. That was that was awesome. Um, so our, our next speaker is Mr. John Bressler. He's the uh, Vice President of Government Relations for the American Association of Port Authorities. And I'm going to try to find his... presentation here, bring that up, there we go, can you all see that? Yes, we do. All righty, um, so um, John, I'm just going to turn it over to you and let you go ahead. And Thanks, Keith. Yeah, John, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Apologies, I've got a bit of a head cold. So my voice is a little off, but I wanted to make sure to be on here today. I'm Vice President of Government Relations for the American Association of Port Authorities based in D.C. So I lead our political and policy shop. And a little bit about AAPA. AAPA was established in 1912. We are the, the voice of the port authorities and the port industry. We represent U.S. public port authorities, but we also represent uh, some Caribbean and Latin American port authorities and Canadian port authorities because of the extensive overlap on trade and, su and supply volumes. We offer a wide range of services to our members. Uh, we, I, I handle the advocacy side where we fight for ports on Capitol Hill and we lobby on behalf of U.S. ports. But we also do a wide range of education and training and information sharing among members. We have seven different technical committees that our members are all uh, able to participate in, such as the Harbors and Navigation Committee, 
the security committee, the legal committee, and, and many others. So those are some of the services that, that we provide. Our members also get discounts to conventions and different guest speaker series uh, and many other services. Uh, next slide, please, Keith. This is a quick snapshot of the 117 uh, public ports that we do represent. You'll see that the focus is in the US. We only lobby and advocate on Capitol Hill for US public port authorities. For our international ports that are members, they like to be members for information and resources. And but, but we do uh, make it clear to them that we only advocate and lobby on behalf of US public port authorities. Next slide, please, Keith. I wanted to show this quick graph of, of federal port funding. One of our primary missions of AAPA is aggressively fighting and advocating for federal port funding on Capitol Hill. You'll see on the slide here, the dramatic increase from FY 2022 to FY 2026. You, you may be wondering why that is. It was because of the, the bipartisan infrastructure law uh, and the Inflation Reduction Act. So we were able to secure nearly 600% higher funding for our ports in FY22 through FY2026 through many different uh, grant programs like the Port Infrastructure Development Program. So while this is great for what we've heard from our ports is that th this is a good down payment. So we're looking ahead to beyond FY2026 right now and starting to lay the groundwork and explain to lawmakers why port funding is, is critical regardless of the party affiliation. The Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law were largely moved through Congress, as you know, under a Democratic-run Congress and administration. But we're trying to make sure that lawmakers remember that infrastructure benefits everybody. And an infra infrastructure should not be a partisan issue and it shouldn't be decreased. We should always be looking to, to increase. But I, I raise this especially because I think uh, I noticed that some of your backgrounds with the motor truck administrations and with the state of Maryland, you all have been, been really good allies. We work, but Baltimore Port is a member of ours. We work very closely with them on ensuring that that funding is, is moved through seamlessly on Capitol Hill. And we're continuing to work with them on a path forward to make sure that there is full funding for the, the recovery and, uh, and restructuring of the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Uh, I'll, I'll pause after, the, feel free to jump in with, with questions. I'll keep rolling, but I won't take offense if you jump in and, and interrupt me and ask questions at any point. All right, next slide, please, Keith. Port cybersecurity. I imagine some of you have, have been working on cybersecurity issues. We have continued to, to get a lot of uh, attention on this topic, largely because of uh, the China, Chinese ship to shore cranes. The Congress and the federal government continues to show a tremendous amount of interest on this topic. They consider the Chinese STS, the ship to shore cranes, uh, a threat, a threat vector. Uh, all of the, the research and studies that we have, the American Association of Port Authorities has been a part of, has shown that, that while there isn't a specific threat vector, we are, of course, more than open and willing to work with our federal government partners on making these ship to shore cranes or other port equipment that's manufactured internationally as secure as possible. Next slide, please, Keith. And this transitions into tariffs. As many of you have seen, the United States Trade Representative in the White House recently implemented a 25% tariff on the ship to shore cranes. We pushed back on these the 25% tariff. The, there is no American manufacturer of port equipment for ship to shore cranes currently. We have been working on reshoring efforts to bring back American manufacturing of ship to shore cranes. In, until that happens, we think that a 25% tariff and tax is basically just a tax on American ports and American terminal operators, American business. So we, we pushed back, we submitted comments, we worked within a wide range of industry partners and we worked at, at the congressional level. 
there was an exempt. This is it, this fact isn't noted in this slide, but there was an exemption for ship to shore cranes that were already ordered before the USTR announcement on the U, the twenty five percent tariff was made, and if the the crane was delivered by May 14, twenty twenty six. So the the vast majority of ports that had already ordered ship to shore cranes were exempt from the twenty five percent tariff. So that was good. That was a a small win for the port industry, but moving forward, all STS cranes that are from China, the ports the ports will order and buy will will have another twenty five percent tacked on. So, if you think of a of a fifteen million dollar crane, that's going to be at least two and a half million dollars tacked on top of that, and so that's going to continue. We we view this as something that's regardless of whether we have a Harris or a Trump administration. They've both shown a tremendous interest in tariffs. And despite the, the, the common sense outlook where you know, ports need to buy this and the American manufacturers ex exist, tariffs are gonna be continued to be a topic of discussion for, for political actors, we, we, we consider that. Uh, next slide, please. This is another uh, slide here talking about Buy America and the need to reshore strategic equipment manufacturing. AAPA has partnered with the Merad administration to determine the, the needs for port equipment among ports. We're in the final stages of that port equipment demand study. Uh, we have interviewed many dozens and dozens of ports and terminal operators to understand what their equipment needs are. And the purpose of that is to then show those results to, to port equipment manufacturers to incentivize them to bring back American manufacturing. Uh, we've also looked at some type of possibility for pooled procurement, where ports would pull together their resources and, and perhaps make larger equipment orders from a manufacturer to bring back some of that American manufacturing base. Uh, we, we view this as something that would be positive for, for everyone. It wouldn't be management versus labor, like it's called the strike. We think everyone would, would benefit through this. We're, I'll touch on it later it's, again, but we are having our AAP's annual convention in Boston, October 27 through 30. And we're having the State Department and the White House and Merritt Administrator Ann Phillips and a number of other government officials meeting with our port directors of, of AAPA to talk about this topic and uh, try to build some consensus on a path forward. Next slide, please, Keith. Thank you. Uh, permitting, very important for our ports. We, I've been at AAP for, for a year now. One of the most common themes that I hear from our ports whenever I ask how we can advocate for them on Capitol Hill was move, streamline some of the bureaucracy and move through some of the permitting for port infrastructure projects more quickly. So we've been working to do that. Uh, the, the, we, we work very collaboratively with Merad and with the DOT, but this, the timelines for whenever they submit an application for a, a PID for a port infrastructure development program grant, for example, until the shovel actually gets into the into the ground at the port is is oftentimes two years. It, it's all it's also very hard for our port staff to get in touch with someone at Merritt or DOT. It's there's a long there's a laundry list of issues surrounding this process of permitting. So we've moved forward legislation called the Port Act that would give greater flexibility in using categorical exclusions. So ports could apply for PIDP grants if Merritt delays a, a full notice of funding opportunity. And we think this would be a step in the right direction. So we were pleased that this bill was included in the defense authorization bill. And we're gonna continue working, working towards this moving forward. However, it's, we had, we've had we had some trouble this Congress because Senate Democrats have pushed back. Uh, they, it's our understanding they don't wanna to touch anything regarding environmental permitting um, simply because the uh, the environmental groups are, are opposed. So. We're going to keep pushing it though, and any any type of support on on this initiative from this group would be appreciated. Uh, next slide, please, Keith. WERDA, Water Resource Development Act, extremely important for our membership. This is the bill 
uh, that authorizes federal navigation channel projects. Uh, the bill is moving through Congress. It, it passed the House and Senate. AAPA has been, been at the table. Our chair of the board of directors testified before Congress on the importance of it. Again, just a, a critical bill. We're encouraging that Congress pass it swiftly. This is, again, a, a not a, this isn't a partisan issue, similar to what I was talking about the infrastructure bill. We view this as a as a, a win win for everyone, whether you're Republican or Democrat. This is a, a good policy uh, that we're going to continue to push for. And the hope is that the Florida bill gets done this fall, either in the lame duck or um, perhaps it could be pushed into the new year. But hopefully, hopefully it'll be wrapped up soon. Uh, next slide, please, Keith. I wanted to flag this quickly. Not sure if any of you have, have had this issue, but wanted to raise it. We've had many of our ports say to us that the Customs and Border Patrol is asking our ports to pay for things like office equipment and leases and office leases and administrative expenses, things that are, they, they all have, the CBP and ports have reimbursable service agreements that they sign and they're focused solely on security related items. Our ports have been have been telling us for the last two years that they consider CBP asking for things outside of the scope of that reimbursable service agreement. For example, just last week I got uh, one of the ports shared with me confidentially a list of of what they consider to be demands from CBP for for twelve laptop computers, which are clearly we view as outside of the scope of the service of the security agreement. So again, similar to some of the other areas that we've heard from from our members, we've we've worked with Congress to introduce legislation to put an end to that. And there there is some been some good movement. The industry uh, letter that we led recently had forty five port director signatures on it, and it, we don't we don't know if this legislation will move in this Congress, but we're hopeful it will be introduced again in the next Congress, and we can make some some headway. Whales. So I, I raise this because sometimes it throws people off a little when we talk about it, but it actually has a, a, a big impact, potential impact on supply chain and freight. Because uh, in the in the North Atlantic, for example, the National Oceanic Administ Atmospheric Administration (NOAA) is moving forward with vessel speed restrictions for all vessels right now. The the vessel speed restrictions are for those vessels 65 feet and over. But NOAA is looking to, to broaden that scope to vessels all the way down to 35 feet, where they'd, go to, they'd be forced to down to 11 knots um, under certain geographic areas during, um, during, during spawning seasons. Uh, we've heard from many of, our, many of the harbor pilots and, and shippers, carriers, recreational, fishermen, commercial fishermen, that this would have a detrimental impact on their businesses in the supply chain. And the harbor pilots tell us in the Atlantic side that it would, it would impede their ability to get in and out of the navigation channels quickly and efficiently, for example, during times of inclement weather. I, I raised that um, on the Atlantic side, but also in the Gulf of Mexico, our members are also concerned because there's a critical habitat designation in the works. So we've had meetings, we've done our advocacy. Uh, the, it's our understanding that there will be some rules coming out on the vessel speed restrictions on the Atlantic side, uh, perhaps right after the election and the critical habitat designation in the Gulf sometime after the election as well. So we think that they're both going to happen after the election because of because they're so politically fraught and there's been a lot of lot of concern on both of these issues. Um, I, I failed to say that the overarching uh, our we of course very much value um, the right whale and the, the rice as well. They're beautiful creatures. We want to protect them and preserve them. However, we think that there should be an industry consensus and there should be more work done with industry to understand how this can be done uh, in, a, in a way that works for, for all parties. Next slide, please, Keith. Offshore wind, uh, another area of interest for ports, um, on the, whether it's on the East Coast or even, even in the Gulf or the West Coast, ports are in their planning stages. 
There's been legislation introduced in Congress to fund offshore wind port infrastructure with some of the um, BOEM lease revenues. That legislation was, was postponed, but we do think that that will probably be reconsidered whenever Congress comes back uh, after the election. Uh, next slide, please, Keith. As a, excuse me, as I wrap up the, the slides and the presentation, just wanted to mention we are looking ahead to the election 2024 potential outcomes and how Republicans or Democrats could impact the election. We we as the, the port in, voice of the port industry at AAPA, we work with the Republicans and Democrats, and we focus on the policy that's best for our members. However, looking ahead, if, if you look at some of these higher tariffs, could actually happen under Republican or Democrat controlled government. Um, but if you have a democratic controlled government, of course, there's more opportunity and likelihood for something like a, another massive infrastructure bill. Whereas if we're under a Republican controlled government, permitting reform, I mentioned the permitting challenge that reports, we think that's more likely. And energy export growth like LNG. Um, so just wanted to, to highlight that as well for, for the group. And the last slide, I believe, is again, just wanted to put in a plug. If anyone's interested in joining us at the APA Annual Convention, we'd love to have you and, and host you. It's going to be in Boston, October 27th through 30. We'll have a wide range of, of discussions on freight, infrastructure, decarb, offshore wind, all the topics I've discussed. And uh, Mayor and Administrator Phillips will be there, as well as several representatives from the White House and the State Department. So I uh, hope, hope some of you can join if you'd like more information about that. Happy to share and glad to take any questions. Thanks again for the invite to join you all today. Yeah, thank you, uh, John. That was a great presentation. Uh, looks like we do have a question, Ar Armand. Yeah, I think it works better when you unmute yourself, I guess. <laughs> Thanks very much for, for taking my question. John, um, great presentation. A uh, question I have is on the crane technology and the perceived threat, uh, cyber threat. Um, so if I uh, remember correctly, you understood that, uh, or you presented that there are no immediate threats that your organization has seen or, or seen evidence of, correct? That's correct. The, the technology exists where it's kind of like a hole in the fence until somebody finds it. Yeah, that's correct. All of our research and all the work we've done with our federal government partners indicates that there hasn't been any breaches. However, of course, it is the role of the federal government to, to, government to ensure that that, that remains in, in place. You know, there's the uh, CFIUS process that takes place for any investment in, in U.S. sports, as, as, as you may know, and we're comfortable with with that process. But again, glad to work with our federal partners and ways that we could improve it more. Yeah, I tell you, I was kind of a, you know, I'm a realist knowing that that those avenues exist should someone, especially foreign government, want to exploit them. But I was kind of a skeptic, you know, and, and kind of felt like you like your organization did until uh, I saw Mike uh, Mike's presentation and the data that's available on uh you know, presumably subscribe sites to gather information down to the granular level. Um, you know, the kind of information that, that Mike has access to obviously is accessible uh, to a lot of people. Um, Keith, do you know if there's anybody from the MPA uh, with us today? I, I didn't catch anybody. Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. It's an unfortunate uh meeting for them to miss. I think there's a lot of information here for them. But uh, thank you, Mike, and thank you, John. Uh, great presentations, and thanks again for taking my question. Thank, thank you, Armand. And feel free to reach out to me anytime if you all want to, Keith or Armand or Mike or anyone on the call. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, there are no other questions. I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to our next speaker, uh, Mr. John Rotz from SHA's Motor Carrier Division. John, you should be able to share your screen, I think. We're going to give that a shot here. And uh, again, I'm going to I'm going to look to you as backup if I uh, if I do this wrong. <laughs> I, I got gotcha. you. 
Let's see here. I do do. If I'm not mistaken, John, there should be a little green button down at the bottom of your screen that says share. Okay. Well, you know what? Why don't you go ahead and jump in and save me from, uh, from embarrassment <laughs> gotcha. here. How's that look? Put this down here, move this over here. Move this. Got too much stuff here on my... There we go. All right, good. Okay. So, yes, I am John Ross from the Motor Carrier Division of State Highway, and our mission is to provide commercial vehicles mobility, safety, security, system preservation, and do this with technology and definitely with partnership. Next. Hello? Next slide. There we go. Okay, so what we do, we manage the uh, truck weigh-in inspection stations. These are the brick-and-mortar uh, guys alongside the the uh, the highway that uh, uh, commercial vehicles are required to pull into uh, when they're open. We also deploy and manage the virtual way stations, which are a little different and which we'll uh, get a chance to uh, look at here as we move forward. Uh, Maryland One. Um, that's our overdimensional permit system. A lot of um, a lot of the freight that moves on the highways uh, falls within that uh, um, legal dimension of uh, of eight foot six wide, thirteen six high, and uh, eighty thousand pounds. But for those single piece uh, cargos that are larger than that, heavier than that. Uh, we do provide permits, uh, which uh, allows the delivery to continue to move. Okay. Somebody didn't there? <laughs> uh, we are the Maryland lead agency for the MixApp. MixApp is the Motor Carrier Safety Assistance Program, which is sponsored by uh, FMCSA. We are a state recipient of approximately $10 million of federal money uh, each year. Uh, shout out to uh, Rob King, who is uh, the uh, uh, division uh, administrator uh, that uh, uh, provides us with that money. And we appreciate that very much, Rob. Um, we also submit the uh, the annual commercial vehicle safety plan, which is the uh, uh, the backbone for uh, how that uh, how that grant money gets spent. Um, we coordinate as part of that safety plan, approximately 20 enforcement agencies. Of course, the largest uh, two agencies, the Maryland State Police and the uh, Maryland Transportation Authority Police, uh, and then a bunch of locals and state uh, other enforcement agencies. We submit the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration Title VI plan this is a state plan that we submit every year, and we make sure that each of our subrecipients have a corresponding Title VI plan, which we monitor. We're also responsible for outreach, outreach to the industry and also to the general motoring public. Next slide, please. I'm trying. There seems to be a delay, though. <laughs> Uh-oh. There we go. No, I didn't move. Not quite. There we go. Okay. So this is what your uh, your traditional way and inspection station looks like. This is the one out on uh, Route 70 at uh, West Friendship. Next slide. Uh, the truckway inspection stations, we are responsible for the building 
and the scale maintenance and update of these uh, buildings. We completed a brand new station at Conowingo, which is up on uh, uh, Route 1, uh, northeast of, uh, of Baltimore, up around the, uh, um, the dam. Uh, new building to be completed in spring at Cecilton, also in that northeast quarter. We're doing renovations to buildings at Del Mar, and we're upgrading or replacing um, most of the other scales uh, throughout the uh, state, as some of them have gotten pretty old and questionable. Next slide. So we have 16 sites throughout Maryland on major highways uh, where these uh, way stations are. Um, most of them are owned by state highway, some of them by transportation authority. Um, the ones that we own, the state highway owns, are operated by the state police. And of course, transportation authority operates their own. All sites have permanent scales. Many have WIM. That's way in motion technology, which are sensors in the ground as they, uh, as they come off the ramp, they go onto the uh, off the main line onto the ramp. That's where they're whimmed, and if they appear to be heavy, uh, they're sent across the uh, the permanent scales. Other than that, they could receive a bypass and get back out onto the highway. Last year, we conducted more than eighty thousand inspections at these way stations. We did more than two million truck weighings, including the WIM. And last year, the virtual weigh stations weighed 21 million. That's one reason why we do those. And there it is, the Maryland virtual weigh station looks a little different than what we just saw with the bricks and mortar. What you're looking at there is a truck going across the sensors in the ground and being picked up on camera uh, so that we can tell the weights of those axles as they go across and the speed. Next slide. This is what we see uh, in our laptops and computers. Uh, this is a good truck going across the sensors. We can see that the axles and the uh, tandems weigh this amount and they are within the legal limit. So we're happy to see that. Next slide. That's a bad truck. Those axles are heavy. Okay, so now if we have law enforcement downstream from this uh, from this vehicle uh, with a laptop, they know that when this truck appears, that's the one that's heavy. That's the one they're going to pull over. That's the one we're going to throw scales on. And ultimately, there's going to be a problem. Next slide. If the, we don't have enforcement downstream, we still have the opportunity. If we can identify the vehicle, there is that caveat, we have to be able to identify the carrier of that vehicle by the camera, then we can send out a field observation notice, a nasty gram, which tells the carrier, yes, we saw you. Yes, we saw that you were overweight. And by the way, a copy of this is going to the state police you probably don't want to continue to do that. Next slide. This is just a quick uh, skinny of where these uh, um, virtual way stations are located between the virtuals and the, um, and the uh, traditional way stations. We have uh, tremendous coverage throughout the state. And by the way, a shout out here going to uh, uh, Michael Pack uh, because a lot of that information is processed, if not all of it, is processed you know, through their um, uh, their uh, uh, their uh, RITIS. Next slide. So, totally why uh, virtual way stations? Obviously, uh, it can uh, can identify the speed, the height, and the weight of each axle in the truck moving at highway speed which is good that the vehicle doesn't have to stop. This keeps the vehicles on the road and is less, uh, it, uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't keep them you know, from doing what they need to do, which is deliver the freight. Identify unsafe trucks and their companies. 
efficient use of law enforcement personnel. Again, they will know up front if this vehicle is a bad one or a good one. They can stop oversized overweight loads on bypass routes. Some of the truckers, if they know that they've got a heavy load, they don't want to go by the way station. So they'll take a bypass road. Unfortunately, sometimes there is a virtual there on that bypass and they do not get past. Minimize damage to roads, bridges, tunnels from overweight loads. Obviously, if we could keep everything moving at the, uh, at the appropriate weight, uh, the maintenance problem would not be as severe. Prevent oversized overweight load permit fraud. Again, we issue the permits and uh, sometimes those permits, um, they're not reported properly. This is one way of backing up that information to make sure that it is correct. Traffic management on state, county, and other road arteries and quick deployment, low capital operational costs. We could spend $800,000 to put up a virtual or 15 million to put up a traditional one. It makes sense. So again, when we talk in terms of most of the freight moving on the highway, most of it is moving at legal dimension. But there are times when there's big equipment uh, or uh, other uh, other product that is just too big. What do we do in order to get it to move safely? And that is issue the permits. Next slide. This is something we don't want to see. This is something where a vehicle that was taller than the bridge hit the bridge, brought it down. 695, all lanes closed for more than eight hours. Next slide. So we have the Maryland One hauling permit system. This is the, oh, you got to click the button again. There we go and click it one more time. There we go. Okay. That's the only one that does this. So let's live with it here. Um, this is the, uh, the authorization for us to do or have a permit system. And this has been, uh, this has been touted um, across, not only uh, across uh, our country, but uh, uh, also, um, uh, demonstrated uh, in um, England, I believe. Shout out to Tina Sanders. She's the one that has been working uh, tirelessly with uh, um, with Bentley and uh, put the system together and um, was, uh, was able to uh, receive a prize for us uh, at that convention. Next slide. General conditions for movement of oversized and overweight vehicles. Again, that's the Comar uh, authorization. Um, vehicles would have to have, if they need them, adequate flag persons and escorts. Not all permit loads require those, but certainly the, the larger ones do. Wide load or over oversized load signs, that's required for all of them. Maintaining proper distance from one truck to another. And we'll see that here in just a moment. Using the shortest practical route. This is how the permit is set up so that uh, they know where they're going. We know where they're going. And those, 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 that route has been approved. Traveling during favorable road and weather conditions, using warning flags during the night and warning lights at night. Next slide. That is something we don't also don't want to see happen. And for vehicles over 14.6, uh, there's a height survey that is required. And in some cases, a pole car is going to be riding in front of the truck. And if that pole taps a bridge, that truck is told to stop, pull over, don't go any further. Next slide. Fines for the carriers that don't want to get a permit or think that they can get by without, there are um, there are things that can happen. These are the fines. Um, 
carrier that has proven to be egregious uh, in not getting the permits that uh, are required and also be restricted from getting permits in the future or having to have surveys done by enforcement before they start. Next slide. Again, thanks to uh, Tina, uh, we've seen that uh, a lot of the uh, um, improvements in the system it used to have, uh, drivers were used to have a, uh, a paper copy of a permit. Now it can be all electronic. They can have it on their smartphones, laptop, and present that to the police if stopped and questioned. Next slide. Maryland One Permits. Maryland issued over 135 permits last year, generated over $17 million worth of revenue. 89% of the permits are issued automatically. Um, and what used to take hours now can take, can take, not always, minutes. Um, with accepted routes, no engineering required. And super loads are the exception. Again, um, most of the freight are going to be bigger than the uh, the legal limits, but not too big. We do have some too bigs. Next. That's a picture of a super load. That's going to be, give or take, I think about 500,000 pounds. Uh, in order to go across smaller bridges, they have to build a bridge over the bridge. That's a jumper bridge. Uh, that takes all of the weight off of that bridge. It would collapse if they hadn't done that. It takes about six to eight hours to build that jumper bridge after the uh, freight goes across, then they take it down, move on to the next small bridge. Next slide. That's a picture of a convoy. Same things, large uh, vehicles that have to be separated by X amount of uh, space. Next slide. That one's even bigger. Next slide. And that's the biggest that we've done. Over 2 million pounds. 271 feet, close to the length of the football field, width 22 feet, a little wider than a regular lane, and height 20 feet. This they could not build a jumper bridge for, and this uh, particular move had to move from one side of I-95 to the other side of I-95, and there's a big bridge there. So what they did was they had to build a bridge across the median strip, exit, uh, go down the exit ramp, go across the median, and then up the entrance ramp on the other side. All lanes of, of 95 had to be shut down during this uh, transport. Next slide. We are the recipients of federal funding in the MixApp program. Uh, again, shout out to uh, to Rob King. Uh, we appreciate the money. Um, this was a specific high priority grant issued to us to do a couple of things. One, to retrofit and upgrade the virtual way stations. Um, I said before that we could identify the vehicle with the camera, but we don't have DOT readers in place. This money here will hopefully get those DOT readers installed on the uh, uh, on the virtuals. Also, we're going to uh, implement new technology. Uh, it's a uh, tire uh, tire sensor uh, um, uh, program. We'll get to that in just a minute. Also, going to provide uh, data alerts for work zones, congestion, and other roadway problems. This will be a partnership with uh, Inrix and uh, DriveWise. DriveWise has a number of carriers that are uh, are party to their system, and this will be an add-on that will give them uh, some additional safety information. Next slide. This is a really poor slide that I could get off the uh, the internet. Unfortunately, it doesn't tell us very much, but this was the tire sensors. And what this does is as the truck goes across these sensors in the road, it identifies the profile of each tire. And if you have a tire that is flat or low on air, 
it will identify that tire. That's an out of service condition. So uh, again, this is one way of alerting uh, people downstream of the virtual way station that the vehicle is not only heavy, but now we've got some bad tires. Next slide. This is another bad slide from the uh, from the internet on the uh, tire sensors. This shows some of the states that have employed this technology. There are two companies that provide this, and uh, of course, we'll have to uh, uh, go out for bid and see uh, which one is going to be doing ours. Next slide. Motor Carrier Safety Assistance Program, the Mix app. Again, we are the lead agency. We write the grants. And we work with the, uh, um, you know, our sub recipients, our enforcement personnel. They are the boots on the ground, operating the stations and roving patrols. And we also monitor the Title VI compliance at state and local level. Next slide. Outreach, more than, um, more than enforcement, we provide outreach uh, both to the industry and to the general motoring public. Outreach to the trucking industry takes the form of signs for regulation and weight enforcement. Uh, we also have printed me media, such as the Maryland Truckers Map or the Motor Carrier Handbook. Um, another form of, of outreach to the industry is the Maryland Safety Summit, where speakers will provide information on a variety of safety topics. Uh, again, shout out to Tina, uh, who is not only uh, responsible for our uh, uh, for our Maryland One program, but she also was the one that has spearheaded this whole safety summit program, which will be on October 4th. It will be at the Maritime uh, Institute. Uh, we did have a limit of 150 uh, participants, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure that we're up to that so that uh, may still have time for people if they wanted to uh, um, attend, uh, they could still contact Tina. Her information will be on the last slide and see if, uh, if there still is um, um, availability there. Next slide. Um, outreach to the industry takes the form of, again, um, this was a uh, rolling uh, billboard that we had on Route 81, um, letting, uh, letting drivers know that there is enforcement out there checking specifically hours of service, speed, and weight. Next slide. This is a picture of the Maryland Truckers Handbook. This has the truck routes. It also has uh, all of the parking places that we are aware of. Uh, both private and in, um, and public. It also has phone numbers for industry. And on the other side of the map, there's a blow up of the port and their operations. Next slide. Oh, outreach education. Not all crashes are caused by the driver of commercial vehicle. General motoring public are provided messages to enhance safety. Basically, these messages are it's dangerous to tailgate trucks because forward visibility is limited. It's also dangerous when you're passing a truck not to pull back in front of that truck without allowing that trucker uh, the stopping distance they need. Most truckers are very responsible and they provide that extra, that extra space needed for them to stop safely. Um, Again, most truckers are very responsible that way. Last week was the, uh, the week for uh, uh, trucker appreciation. And um, uh, shout out to uh, um, uh, to Lewis Campion and his, uh, um, his uh, organization. Uh, again, a lot of responsible truckers out there. Next slide. If a truck stops quickly, can you? Don't tailgate trucks. This is uh, a, um, a screenshot of one of our, uh, or several uh, of our uh, uh, you know, roadside signs. And uh, next slide. There's the other one. Uh, don't cut off trucks. Again, this message is largely for um, 
the general public that don't realize just what the uh, um, you know you know the operations of commercial vehicles you know how uh, how demanding that is they need to be a part of uh, keeping the roadways safe next slide um, another uh, another example of print media where we put this message out there uh, for the general public next slide and that's the last slide. Oh my goodness, I don't have Tina's information on there. Oh my. Okay, I had that on my copy, not on yours, uh, uh, Keith. Um, they can they can call in. Um, hmm, Tina, Tina, Tina. They anybody can reach out to me or you if they want. We can, yeah, we can yeah, that that'll be fine. And again, I can't promise you that there's a space open, but. Uh, um, and and I will say that uh, the messages that will be provided at the um, Commercial Vehicle Safety Summit will be largely geared towards the industry, um, the the changes and things that uh, uh, that they need to be aware of. That's all I got. All right. Well, thank you, John. That was a uh, that was great. Um, Let's see, do we have any questions for John? Uh, uh, Tina just put her uh, information in the chat box if anybody wants it. Great. Uh, questions for John? I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so you guys can see my ugly mug now. Um, so we have a couple more minutes if there's no questions for John. If anybody has uh, any updates that they'd like to, to share with us, we have a minute or so. Hey, Keith, I have a quick question for John. Sure. Armand. Um, hi, John. How are you? Doing good. Good. Thank you for the presentation. It was great. Uh, my question is the uh, trucker's map that you had on one of your slides. Do you yes. know if it's available uh, digitally? It is available digitally. In fact, that's the only way. We used to have paper copies, and we found that uh, um, not everybody was already, you know, all all that interested in those. But yes, by all means. Um, okay, I'll probably reach out to you for the link. Uh, or sure. Find it myself, and uh, you know, we can we can discuss uh, maybe linking that on our new site. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yep. JT. Keith, thanks. Uh, just a heads up to everyone. Um, and now I have a, a high bar set for agenda with speakers today, but October 23rd is our next Maryland statewide freight advisory committee meeting. Uh, no overlapping speakers. So if you do not have that calendar invite and you would like to attend, send me an email. I just dropped my email and address into the box. But thanks, everyone. Thanks, John. Okay, any other questions? Um, if there's no other questions, I think we can give everybody about eight minutes of their time back. Um, just like to thank our speakers once again for uh, some very uh, excellent presentations, um, very informative. So. Uh, if anybody has, thinks of any questions after we uh, are done with this meeting, I'm sure we, we have all their contact information. Uh, we can get those questions to those guys, and uh, I'm sure they'd be happy to answer them. Uh, our next meeting is scheduled for December 18th. Uh, if anybody has any suggestions for topics to discuss, or if there's interest in a field trip possibly, or and if you have any contact information for possible field trips, let me know. Um, Otherwise, um, I'm going to give you your time back, like I said, and uh, thank you all for coming and have a great day. Thank, thank you, Keith. Very much.